Hello, this is Dr. Akram Habibi from NYU Langone Orthopedic Hospital, and I will be discussing a case of simultaneous extensor mechanism reconstruction with a primary total knee arthroplasty. These are our disclosures. No industry support was provided for the production of this video. The overall incidence rate of extensor mechanism injury is about 3.47 per 100,000 patient years. The most common cause is patella fractures, followed by patella tendon ruptures and quadricep tendon ruptures. There has been an increasing rate of extensor mechanism injuries, likely due to the aging population and increased activity in this patient population. Our patient is a 58-year-old female with a history of hypertension and diabetes. She has a BMI of 37.5 and a hemoglobin A1C of 4.5. She had a prior proximal tibial fracture about 22 years prior with an operative repair. She also had a patella fracture, which was treated non-operatively and resulted in a non-union. On physical examination, she ambulated with an antalgic gait. She had a well-heeled anterior and lateral knee incision. She had passive range of motion from 5 to 100 degrees, but was unable to perform a straight leg raise. Anterior, posterior, and lateral imaging demonstrate a lateral plate with screws and a well-heeled proximal tibial fracture and a non-union of the patella. Magnetic resonance imaging of the knee demonstrated intact quadriceps that will be amenable to a extensor mechanism reconstruction. Surgical options were considered. In the setting of autograft, the most commonly used tendon would be the semitendinosus. However, this would lead to increased morbidity due to the additional incision and would not be appropriate for a deficient patella. Allograft includes Achilles tendon or whole extensor mechanism allografts. With a deficient patella, this would require the use of a whole extensor mechanism. Synthetic options include polypropylene meshes, which offer the benefit of decreased cost, decreased immune reactivity, and less stretching over time. Based on the patient's history and previous surgeries, the decision was made to use a synthetic mesh. The patient was positioned in supine and her previous lateral and anterior incisions were identified. On the back table, a monofilament polypropylene mesh was folded approximately 10 times over itself. The mesh was then secured using a locking suture. Our attention was then turned to the proximal tibia. An incision was made utilizing the previous lateral incision. The subcutaneous tissue and fascia were cleared from the plate and screws. The proximal screws from the plate and the tubercle screw were removed to allow for appropriate seating of the tibial component. Next, we made a midline incision utilizing the patient's previous anterior incision. A standard medial peripatellar arthrotomy was then performed. We then mobilized the vastus lateralis with a combination of Mayo scissors and blunt dissection and performed a pedalectomy of the non-union fragments. A navigation pin was then placed into the distal femur and the navigation array was attached. The hip center and anatomical landmarks were then registered. A distal femoral cutting guide was placed utilizing navigation and further fine adjustments were carried out to achieve the desired alignment. The guide was secured and the distal femoral cut was performed. Next, the navigation pin was then placed into the proximal tibia and the navigation array was attached. Bony landmarks of the tibia were registered. The tibial cutting guide was secured and the proximal tibia cut was made using an oscillating saw. The medial and lateral gaps were assessed with an extension spacer block and were stable. A 4-in-1 cutting guide for the appropriately sized femur was positioned and used to make the remaining femoral cuts. A spacer block was then used to assess the flexion gaps and they were found to be stable. A trial tibial base plate was secured into place followed by a trial femoral component. A trial liner was then placed and flexion and extension gaps were found to be satisfactory. A posterior lateral non-displaced fracture of the femoral condyle was appreciated and all trial components were removed. A reduction clamp was used to secure the fragment and three 3.5 millimeter screws were placed in a lag by technique fashion. The fragment was found to be stable. Both the vastus medialis and lateralis were mobilized to allow for the extensor mechanism reconstruction.
The tibial stem, drill, and punch were used to prepare the proximal tibia. A high-speed burr was then utilized to enlarge the canal to accommodate the mesh. The mesh was inserted and marked to ensure appropriate positioning during cementation. Cement was applied to the end of the mesh and pressurized into the tibial canal. A divot was made into the cement and the mesh was inserted. The tibial base plate was then inserted and impacted into position. Cement was then placed on the distal femur and the femoral component was impacted into place. A trial liner was placed and the cement was allowed to cure an extension. A final liner was then placed. Next, we turn our attention to the extensor mechanism reconstruction. The mobilized vastus lateralis was placed underneath the mesh and the vastus medialis oblique was placed over the mesh. These were then closed in a pants over vest fashion using non-absorbable braided polyethylene sutures. Two drains were placed in the medial and lateral gutters and the incision was closed in a layered fashion. Postoperative imaging demonstrates well-positioned total knee arthroplasty implants and a reduced lateral femoral condyle fracture. The patient was made non-weight bearing for one and a half months with cast immobilization exchanged every three weeks. Wound drains and negative pressure wound vacuum were used. Oral cephalexin for three months was provided and she was discharged home on postoperative day three. Six-week postoperative imaging demonstrates well-aligned total knee arthroplasty implants without evidence of failure. At six weeks follow-up, the incision was slow to heal with small areas of scabbing. She was neurovascularly intact distally and the long leg cast was replaced with a hinge knee brace locked in extension during ambulation and unlocked from zero to 30 degrees for gentle range of motion while seated. She was transitioned to weight bearing as tolerated. A systematic review of the literature assessing synthetic mesh versus oligraphic tensor mechanism repairs in total knee arthroplasty patients found equivalent success rates between the two groups. In addition, similar improvements in the knee society scores and extensor lag postoperatively were noted. These groups also had equivalent reconstruction failure rates. A multicenter retrospective study assessing mesh versus oligraphic sensor mechanism repairs in total knee arthroplasty patients found no differences in patient reported outcomes and similar extensor lags postoperatively. There were no differences in revision rates between the two groups and similar five year survival rates were found. A series study of 77 patients with extensor mechanism reconstruction looked at 18 patients with primary total knee arthroplasty components in place and 59 patients treated during or after revision total knee arthroplasty. The study found improved extensor lag from 26 degrees to 9 degrees postoperatively, and at latest follow-up, 84% of reconstructions were in place and had improved functional outcomes. Advanced imaging should be acquired preoperatively to assess the extensor mechanism. Preparation of the mesh can be performed prior to the incision on the back table. It is important to remove all hardware that may block the placement of total knee arthroplasty implants. Ensure adequate exposure and mobilization of the quadriceps. A burr can be utilized to create a trough to accommodate the mesh. Apply cement to the mesh to allow for appropriate interdigitation. These are our references. Thank you very much.